Good morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and doing Think Tech talks here on a given Tuesday morning. I'm here with Chip Flesher, Associate Dean of SOAS, the School of Ocean and uh, what? Earth Science, Earth and, Science Technology. and Technology. Okay, and that's at UH Manoa. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, climate change. I call this update on climate change, and I really like to talk about that with Chip because he is the probably the greatest authority in the state on it. Thank and you. since that state has so many implications, that is really saying something. Mm -hmm. Climate change is very important in Hawaii and around the world. Yeah. Thanks for coming down. Sure, you're welcome. So I have increasing concern about this. The reason I have increasing concern about it is I don't hear enough about it. Hmm. And I want to hear about it. I, I want to hear all the time about it. I want to hear that something is done. And I, and I saw in the paper on a trip I recently took that uh, Mayor Blumberg was uh, concerned about it in Manhattan, probably based on that storm. And he was uh, trying to do public works projects around Manhattan because Manhattan is not that high over sea level and you know it would be a, an inundation of lower Manhattan would be very costly not only to New York but the country yes um, and it's coming you know so I guess my first question to you Chip is it is it inevitable in, inevitable inexorable I mean is there anything that can happen to stop it uh, or is that you know it's French now les jeux sont faits is the die cast Jean Paul yeah. Sartre is the die cast is it beyond anything we can do fait accompli yeah um, yes, there is a certain amount of sea level rise that has already been put into the pipeline, so to speak. A recent paper just came out saying that for every one degree Fahrenheit of uh, warming that takes place, you're committed, geologically committed, to over four feet of sea level rise. And we've had 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit of uh, global warming take place over the last hundred years. So uh, it does look like we're committed to several feet, four feet, plus or minus. Uh, of sea level that rise. That hasn't happened yet. That, that has not happened yet. Um, that is probably over the long term, and I'm speaking in terms of greater than a century. However, the uh, best models are predicting, and, and uh, side note on this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which reports out every five to seven years on the state of the science, a report was um, just leaked apparently, and it was probably intentional stating that we can expect on the order of three feet of sea level rise by the end of this century. And that number is totally consistent with science that has been uh, published for the last three or four years. Uh, in fact, there's some very valid science that says we'd be looking at more than three feet of sea level rise uh, this century. The National Academy of Sciences published a report saying that we can expect about a foot of sea level rise by mid-century. That is That's on the order of 2050. Yeah, by 2050, and someplace between six and nine inches of sea level rise 15 years from now, by roughly 2030. Sea level is rising around the world. It's currently rising at about one foot per century, and uh, here in Hawaii, it's rising on the order of six inches per century, one and a half millimeters per year. Now, the reason why sea level is rising slower in Hawaii than uh, the global average is because winds in the Pacific uh, blow the water, tip, and what's happening now is they're, they're blowing the water to the west, and the western Pacific, the western tropical Pacific and Micronesia uh, and areas to the west of us are experiencing sea level rise on the order of uh, three feet per century. So right this is sort of a slosh effect going That's west. Right. They get the sea level rise that we might otherwise get. That's right. And um, it's anybody's guess as to when this wind effect, and it's thought to be part of a process known as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, a long-term climate process that is similar to uh, the El Nino process that we're familiar with. It's anybody's guess as to when this will end. The winds will slow down, and we may see that water come back come across. Back. And then we'll have a, yeah. uh, an Then we will see an acceleration in sea level rise. And there are other processes that may come to play in a warmer world that we just don't know about, or processes we do know about they're going to look, that are going to look different. Um, predicting the future is uh, a risky business, but uh, the numbers I've given you are where the state of science is right now. I have so many questions. I, I hope you tolerate my my question. I'll tolerate them, sure. There was a piece in today's paper. Some guy wrote a letter. I, I actually know this guy. Um, and he said, uh, oh, it happens. It happens from time to time. We have ice ages. We have warm ages. Mm -hmm. This is just another one of those rotations. It's true that climate does change naturally. But we, we understand natural climate change. Ice ages occur, they come and go every 100,000 years over recent geologic history. And in between ice ages, we have warm periods. 
and we're in the current warm period. It's lasted for roughly 10,000 years. It's been warm, hence we've developed agriculture, domesticated animals, modern city-based, you know, uh, community-based civilization has, has arisen. Um, even within the last 10,000 years, we know that the climate has been slowly cooling, heading down towards the next ice age. And all of this climate change that I've discussed is because of Earth's uh, orientation to the sun. It's, Earth doesn't, doesn't move in a perfect circle around the sun. It moves uh, in uh, some years an oblong uh, orientation, and then 100,000 100, years later it will go more circular. I could go on and on. The axis of Earth tilts. The axis draws a circle in the sky as it wobbles. These come together to expose more or less land north of us in northern Canada and northern Europe to cold summers or warm summers. If you have a cold summer, then the snow from the previous winter can last until the next winter, and it can reflect more sunlight, and you can drive yourself into an ice age because of this orientation of Earth's orbital parameters. To summarize all that, we know why natural climate change happens, and today's climate change, today's global warming, is caused by humans, and it's not part of a natural process. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you. So, I mean, is, is there a natural part of it, or is it all caused by humans? I believe it's all caused by humans. There are natural oscillations embedded in today's global warming, such as the sunspot cycle, which is an 11-year cycle where the sun is slightly brighter and slightly uh, duller. Um, we've just come from a very low period of sunlight. 2010, 2011, in 2012 we came out of it. So we had a period of low solar um, radiation and now we're moving up to the next period of higher solar radiation. Uh, the ENSO, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation Process, that releases heat from Pacific waters during an El Nino year and it can warm the planet, make one year warmer than the next year. So there are these, these impacts on climate change. Also when volcanoes erupt, a large volcanic eruption can throw aerosols in the stratosphere and can reflect sunlight and lead to temporary global cooling. These are all taken into account. They all tend to cause the climate to oscillate. And it's one reason why we have not seen consistent warming from one year to the next. It's why we uh, see some years cooler, some years warmer. But overall, over the 20th century, and especially since uh, the late 1970s, there's been uh, very strong global warming taking place. Sounds like something you said about that cyclical effect that you, if you have the, the man-made influences, they disrupt um, a fragile system. They, they override. And they, then the fragile system tries to do its thing, but it's different mm -hmm. because of these influences, these man-made influences. That's right. The, the human impact on climate has a stronger influence than the orbital parameters at this stage. If the orbital parameters were controlling climate, as I mentioned, we'd be slowly cooling. The planet would be slowly cooling off. And by slowly, I'm talking about thousands of years until we move into the next ice age, which would be uh, a couple of tens of thousands of years from now. I think my, my, my ski jacket will help me. I think we're pretty good in Hawaii, although during the last ice age, um, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa were apparently glaciated. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just got to wait a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so, um, you know, I, and I also uh, wanted to ask you about this thing with the uh, Antarctic shelf. Uh, there was a piece in the New York Times that suggested that the, that the shelf was collapsing or part of it was collapsing. Maybe this has happened before, but uh, that doesn't happen in the North Pole. It happens in the South Pole, apparently. And there was some speculation or some scientific conclusion, whatever, uh, that this was going to accelerate the uh, sea, sea level rise. Yeah, of course, um, the North Pole is an ocean called the Arctic Ocean, which is covered by sea ice. The South Pole is a continent called Antarctica. And on Antarctica, you have glaciers that flow down ice sheds, similar to watersheds. They flow into the Southern Ocean, and uh, the forward leading edge of the glacier floats. That creates an ice shelf. And um, as that ice shelf extends out into warmer and warmer water, um, research has shown that the bottom of the ice shelf uh, is warmed by the warming seawater due to, due to global warming. And uh, the ice shelf can crack and lead to very large tabular icebergs that break off. When you have a major calving event like that, the glacier to which it is tied uh, accelerates. And we see an acceleration of glaciers up uh, on the Antarctic continent 
out into the ocean. And the more that the warm seawater breaks off and causes these big calving events, the more the glaciers will, f the faster the glaciers will flow into the ocean, leading to more calving. Um, and those calving was that, what's that calving right? is where you break off a big piece of the uh, of the uh, glacier. Um, uh, you break off a piece of the ice shelf, it melts, and that contributes to sea level rise. Hmm. Is it happening? I mean, is that going it to is, accelerate things for us? Well, um, it, it is expected to accelerate, um, and it is, a, it is a cause of sea level rise. There are other causes of sea level rise, of course. Uh, in Greenland, um, the ice sheet itself is melting, and um, recent science has shown that the surface of the Greenland ice sheet has a 50% probability of going into a state of full decay by the year 2025. That's only 12 years from now. Yeah. And, as, and that's a uh, irreversible process. When the entire surface of the Greenland ice sheet goes into decay, it means that the surface of the Greenland ice sheet starts to lower in elevation, which means that you have less snowfall accumulating. And less slow snowfall means that you get more rapid decay which is a positive feedback, and eventually the uh, surface of the ice sheet lowers to the point where it's out of the snowfall range, and you're just in uh, a fossil ice sheet that's rapidly decaying into the ocean. So these, these factors could accelerate it, and uh, maybe they are accelerating it. And the, the, the piece in the New York Times said that uh, there was some expectation of like 16-foot sea level rise before um, you know, the, uh, the end of the century. And it also said that people born today would be right in the middle of things. Mm. Well, 16 feet before the end of the century is a radical projection, and I don't know many scientists that would adhere to that, although there are some very, very um, mainstream scientists that feel that we have uh, greatly underrated the problem of sea level rise, uh, and that um, we could be looking at a true catastrophic situation as we pass into the second half of the century. So one thing I do, I do want to get, we touched on this, but I want to just get it clear, is that uh, even if we stop using all the fossil fuel mm -hmm. that we use, even if we were good in, you know, in every way, that we, we followed all the rules and did everything was expected of us by the scientific community, could we roll this back in any appreciable way, or is it already, as I said, les jeux sont faits, the die she is already cast? Research just came out saying that extreme heat waves are expected to double by the year 2020 and quadruple by the year 2040, regardless of additional CO2 production. So regardless of uh, how much additional CO2 we put in the air, we're going to see an increase in heat waves. Regardless of how many more greenhouse gases we produce, we're going to see uh, several feet of sea level rise. We may slow the onset of some of these processes, but the uh, heat that's in the climate system now, that's in the pipeline, so to speak, uh, is busy changing the world right now, and it's going to continue changing the world regardless of what we do. That is no reason, obviously, to uh, stop our attempts to mitigate climate change. We need to mitigate climate change for the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. Um, and they're going to point to us as a criminal generation if we don't stop this process right now. But I have to tell you, there is a lot of reason to be optimistic. We can be optimistic that we are in the midst of a new second industrial revolution, that we are moving off of dirty carbon as our source of energy and onto a truly sustainable source of energy. We can leave the world a better place than it was given to us, and we're well on the way to doing that. We have um, already doubled our renewable energy, and it will double again by 2020. We the world or we Hawaii? The U.S. Renewable energy accounts for about half of all new energy generation in the United States. 35 states have renewable energy targets already in place, and they're acting on them. U.S. carbon pollution has fallen to its lowest level in 20 years. The EPA is issuing new carbon pollution rules for, car for power plants. By 2025, new vehicle efficiency standards will eliminate an entire year's worth of U.S. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we're well on the way, and uh, we need to continue this. The place where we need to worry is uh, to get Congress on board, but also to get India and China 
on board as well. I was going to ask you that. I mean, it's like, let's say the U.S. does a good, you know, first, we're making a distinction between stopping and rolling it back and mitigating. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you have the chance to roll it back, well, maybe you have an opportunity that, you know, that, that would allow you to save, save the whole problem. Uh, but we don't have that. And so now we have to focus on mitigation. I'm right. going to talk to you more about exactly what that is. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that here the U.S. could be the best boy on the block. Mm -hmm. They could follow all the rules, do all the renewables. That still doesn't solve the problem worldwide in mitigation either because there are other countries who may or may not ascribe to these principles. Mm -hmm. They'd be pumping out all kinds of carbon every day. Mm -hmm. And um, our efforts you know, would only be partial at best. However, it does one very powerful thing. It gives us back the bully pulpit. It allows us at our climate negotiations, it allows us at all of the times and, and places where our government officials get together with other governments to begin to pound the table. They can no longer point at us and say that, um, you know, we're, we're not walking the walk. Uh, we can say that we are walking the walk. You know, uh, the U.S. emissions have dropped to the lowest of the last several decades. It was previously thought that this was because of the fracking revolution, that because of uh, hydraulic fracturing of shales, tight shales that didn't release oil easily in the past, but um, now with these new techniques are releasing oil and also releasing natural gas uh, for energy use, um, that, that the uh, change from uh, uh, petroleum energy production to methane or natural gas energy production uh, which releases less CO2 is what lowered our CO2 emissions. It turns out that that was not the main reason why we lowered our CO2 emissions. The main reason was because we've taken such a strong movement towards renewable energy and because of our automobile uh, uh, fuel efficiency standards have improved. And we've only just begun that process. So the small steps that we've taken already have already lowered U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. We're going to take a short break, Chip. Uh, this is Think Tech Talks. It's a given uh, Tuesday. We're talking about climate change. We're doing an update on climate change with Chip Fletcher, the Associate Dean of SOWEST, School of Ocean, um, I get this, Earth Science. Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. I want to tell you about our program this month. We're doing a lunch and panel program at the Plaza Club with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and Think Tech about China. It's don't be afraid to send your kid or CEO to China. Stories of daring do and of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. We want to introduce you to some people who have lived in China and show you that life in China is not so bad. It's not all about corruption and environmental degradation and lack of civil or human rights. It's not like that. And we want to have them tell you their day-to-day -day stories about how they have lived there. So our moderator is Larry Foster. He has taught uh, law in China, and he has taught, been practicing law in China for a firm in, uh, in Shanghai. His wife, Brenda Foster, is on the panel. Uh, she has been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. We have Russell Liu. He's an attorney practicing with Shepard Mullen uh, in Beijing for quite some time. Shackley Ruffetto, a circuit court judge from Maui, who, uh, after retiring, went to China so he could teach judicial process there. And uh, Nikki Shishido, who has worked for DBED, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism of the State of Hawaii uh, in Beijing for some time. All these people have had the experience of living on the ground in China. We want to have them tell their stories to you. So maybe this will encourage you to send your kid or CEO to China. So if you're interested in this program, which ought to be very interesting, come down on August 22nd. You can sign up at hvca.org. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We'll see you there. We're back. We're live with Chip Fletcher, Associate Dean of SOAS at UH Manoa. This is a Think Tech Talks. We're talking about climate change. We're doing an update on climate change. I'd like to, uh, you know, punctuate our discussion at this point. Uh, now that you're talking about uh, you know, discussions on the floor of Congress, you, you might mention that on the record here. Um, I'd like to know what's happening in the country. Who's talking about what? How strong, you know, is the awareness about climate change? Uh, and is it, is it strong enough? Mm. Um, you know, I've noticed, at least here, our local uh, newspaper, the Honolulu Star Advertiser, is slowly having more articles about climate change. I think it's uh, at least one article a week, maybe it's a couple articles per week. 
If you wanted, you could publish an entire newspaper every day filled with new scientific findings of climate change. This is a huge new area where all fields of science, chemistry, biology, geology, physics, all fields of science are moving into climate change. And um, as far as public awareness, I think it's, it's becoming more prevalent. We have different types of media. Uh, they are influenced to different degrees by their political affiliations. You can find a lot of climate change on ABC and MSNBC. Uh, you find uh, climate change discussion on Fox News in the form of denying the reality of climate change. Still. Still, That's still absolutely. an issue. Yeah, yesterday there was a big discussion about how, as we discussed a few minutes ago, natural cycles are what are responsible for the current climate change, which has been debunked over and over again in the scientific literature. But um, humans have a tendency to listen to what we already believe. And, you know, your political affiliations and your, your uh, worldview, your perceptions of the world, um, these are going to color what you choose to accept or not accept, even though you might be presented with the facts. This means we can't simply lay out the facts in front of, um, you know, uh, the public. You can't just lay them out and expect the public to pick it up and, and understand what's going on. It, it, it means that we need to uh, insert climate change in all elements of um, public understanding. For instance, education. Uh, the school national, education, education of children in school. Education of children from kindergarten all the way up through graduating from college. Mm -hmm. There is in fact a, uh, a, a national program funded by the National Science Foundation for uh, climate change education. And they have nine nodes around the U.S. One of these nodes for climate change education is located here in Honolulu. The University of Hawaii is a partner and Prell, a nonprofit. Uh, nonprofit um, education resource in, in uh, South entity. Pacific, yeah, yeah right I, here in this building. That's right, and we're involved in um, building uh, climate change awareness into the curricula of all of the seven U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. In fact, we were just in the Marshall Islands two weeks ago um, giving workshops to principals and to master teachers. They in turn will develop curricula and they'll pass it down to the other teachers. And we're, we're going to be in Palau in September and uh, climate change education starting from the youngest kids is one way to get the public to see the reality of this problem. You, you know, what's the role of the scientist? I mean, you are a scientist as well as associate dean, which makes you an academician in every way. Um, but how, how, what is the role properly of somebody in your spot to get out there and talk to people? How much of your time do you spend doing that? I personally spend a lot of time doing that. I think um, what you do in life is controlled to a great degree by what are your proclivities and where do you find joy. So there are scientists who are fantastic scientists that just don't find it fun to go out and talk to the public. Um, and you know, I can't fault them for that. You, in fact, you probably wouldn't want some of these people to go out there and educate the public. Other folks uh, can step into that role. I like to encourage all scientists to step out and to engage the public because I find it extremely rewarding and in fact it's a great learning experience. I've had I've been challenged on a number of occasions uh, on some of my statements, in turn challenging my thinking, and I've had to go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and rethink. The challenges uh, which you took seriously. The challenges which you take seriously. And all scientists will, will appreciate good criticism. And well, that's a, that's a whole new role for scientists. I mean, you have an issue now that affects everybody, mm -hmm. where, where the political establishment doesn't necessarily understand the science. The only people who really understand it are the scientists. Uh, and so uh, in order for us to be informed, you have to come talk to us. Yes, although this is not rocket science, if I could, <laughs> okay. if I could state it that way. You know, warming the air, is, it's not difficult to understand the ramifications of that. When you warm the air, yes, it's likely that you're going to have more powerful wild, wildfire f uh, fires. You're going to have spreading drought. We have three terms we've been bandying about, mm -hmm. and uh, one of them is cl climate change, one of them is global warming, one of them is sea level rise. Are they all the same thing? Are they all different? What's the cause and effect in relationship of these terms? Global warming is caused by humans burning heat-trapping gases, typically carbon-based gases that, that trap heat in the atmosphere. These greenhouse gases have led to climate change. So global warming causes climate change. Among the many negative impacts of climate change is sea level rise. Sea level rise, uh, an increase in large-scale wildfires, 
uh, spreading drought, increased in rain intensity and flooding, increased where, uh, rain temperature, sea level rise are all a bundle, uh, part of a bundle of impacts that are resulting from climate change, which okay. is caused by global warming. Okay. So understanding all of that, <clears throat> you know, what is going, if we do nothing, I mean, if the world does nothing, what is going to happen to Hawaii? That's my big question. Uh, you know, what's the worst case now? For example, the, the word, there have been these storms all around the mainland lately, all around the world, mm -hmm. that are more severe than storms we remember. And sometimes the paper tells you that, sometimes it's, it's just, it's, it's a fact ignored. <laughs> and you know that it's more severe than it used to be. Nobody makes a point of it, though. I think it was clear in the case of Sandy in New York, that was pretty serious. Um, and it suggests that, that, that we could have, we here in Hawaii, could have a storm like that, unprecedented storm like that, anytime, not in 20 years or 50 or by the end of the century, but pretty soon. Every time I look out at the sun shining, the beautiful weather and all that, I think, ooh, how many days is it, you know, mm -hmm. probability wise, to a storm like Sandy? So Hawaii uh, sits in a sweet spot. We actually are almost ideally located. To our east, the water temperature tends to be a little cooler and the winds aloft, the high altitude winds, tend to be relatively strong. When a hurricane wanders into this territory, the cool waters um, uh, reduce the fuel to the hurricane and the winds aloft tend to shear the top of the hurricane and um, this downgrades the wind speed, it downgrades the hurricane to, to um, um, you know, uh, a lower level storm. And those conditions still exist, and it's, re it's, it's the reason why we haven't yet had a hurricane uh, run aground in Hawaii from the windward side. When we do have hurricanes hit, in the past they have come from the south or they've come from the west after originating to the south. Uh, and this is where hurricanes uh, typically pass south of the islands and then if the trade winds happen to turn off at just the wrong time, the hurricane can fish hook to the north, and that's what happened with Hurricane Aniki. But typically, Hawaii is not a hurricane-prone location. As the waters to our east warm, and as the wind patterns change, we may become more vulnerable to hurricanes coming from the east. And also, as I mentioned, as storm tracks migrate to the north. So um, I don't think it's something that will happen any day but it's, uh, it's a situation that we're moving inexorably into, and we could have uh, a hurricane make landfall from the windward side. Um, I, I remember... Know, uh, we've gotten close recently. In the, ca in the case of Aniki, um, the damage was enormous, uh, as Eva before, yeah. although I think Aniki was worse. Um, and in that case, both, both of those hurricanes missed Oahu pretty much, and there's no significant damage here. Yeah, they missed Oahu. But yeah. Um, there was significant damage on, on the leeward coast, high waves and uh, storm surge mm -hmm. on the leeward coast of Oahu. But the damage to Kauai was enormous. Um, over 5,000 homes were made uh, unlivable. Uh, water supplies, electricity went out. Um, you know, basically the entire or large parts of the island became homeless. Uh, it was a devastating, a devastating storm. If you, if you put that kind of intensity you take it away from, you know, move it from Kauai to Oahu, the center of population, the center of commerce and industry, such as it is, then you get a, you get a, a telescoped effect, right, on yes. the, the economy of the state. Well, the gasoline refinery that we have on Oahu, which supplies the whole state with gasoline, is located nearly at sea level. It's in the Barbers Point area. Storm surge could wipe it out, and for that matter, a um, a good-sized tsunami could wipe it out. A tsunami of the same size that hit in 1946 could wipe out our only source of gasoline. If we don't have gasoline, who's going to fly their airplane to Hawaii because they can't refuel to turn around and leave? Who's going to drive their, their uh, cargo ship to Hawaii because they can't refuel to leave? I think the only way that we could be saved is um, by the good graces of uh, outsiders flying and driving their uh, their cargo ships to Hawaii, recognizing that they're going to have to stay until the gasoline refinery comes back online, or aircraft carriers coming here and essentially giving us what we need. It's going to be a very strange situation for a week or two or three 
if that gasoline refinery is taken out. And it's very vulnerable. And as sea level rises, um, it won't, it'll take lower and low, uh, lower and lower level hur uh, hurricanes and tsunamis to damage that refinery. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, we're going to take another break. Sure. That's Chip Fletcher, Associate Dean of the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. Very good. I'm <laughs> Jay Fidel. We're doing a Think Tech Talks here on a given Tuesday. We're talking about climate change. We're having an update on climate change. And we'll be right back after this message. Aloha, I'm Sharon Moriwaki with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Please join Jay Fidel and me every Wednesday, 4 o'clock p.m. on Energy Wednesday. See you I, then. I'm Donna Blanchard of Kumu Kuhui Theater, and when I was young, I used to love watching Charlie Chan movies on Family Classic TV on Sunday afternoons. Our show at Kumu Kuhua that runs from August 22nd through September 22nd is called Will the Real Charlie, Charlie Chan Please Stand Up? It's written by Nancy P. Moss and takes place right here in Chinatown. I really hope you'll come in and watch it. You will love it. It's everything about the movies that you loved and more. Go to kumukuhua.org to get more information and your tickets. We'll see you there. We're back. We're live. We're here at Think Tech, Think Tech Talks. We're having an update on climate change from Chip Fletcher, Associate Dean of SOWEST at UH Manoa. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about, you know, what would happen in the event of a, uh, of a uh, you know, a, a, a severe storm, the kind of storm you might expect with uh, climate change. Um, but, you know, you said something before that really catches me, and that is we, in, in a complex society, we can't necessarily figure out all the ripple effect implications of climate change and even a storm on how our society would work, how our community would be affected. Um, how do you figure that out? What do you do? Well, that's the job of civil defense, I think. And the more brains you get in the room, the better the thinking's going to be, I've always believed. And civil defense brings in experts in these various fields of not only the science of uh, the atmosphere, but also sociology and political science, yeah. brings these folks in. Um, and ask them to sort of uh, help them brainstorm uh, what are the ripple effects that are going to be associated with the next hurricane that makes landfall or the next large tsunami that causes damage. But that is also, you know, the inexorable uh, sea level rise in, in an island community where most of what happens is happening right along the, the perimeter of the islands. That's where people Correct. live. Correct. Yeah. That's where businesses are, and some of those businesses are really right at sea level. Yeah. I know there are there are islands in the South Pacific where they're already inundated. Uh, we could be inundated too over time, uh, but that would that would have that would change our, our our whole society, wouldn't it? Very slowly. Yeah. Sea level rise um, has a funny characteristic to it. Uh, it's a slow sort of background process that you don't notice. Um, but it makes far worse uh, dramatic episodes such as tsunamis and hurricanes. Yeah. You know, in the state, if you were to pin down two, uh, two uh, negative impacts of climate change that perhaps might be at the top of your list, there'd be uh, decreased rainfall and water resources, and the second one might be sea level rise. We're actually um, quite active in the area of decreased rainfall and water resources or water sustainability. Just yesterday, Brian, uh, Senator Brian Schatz held a uh, half-day symposium at the Capitol Auditorium on uh, water sustainability and asked uh, the heads of state uh, departments, asked some NGOs, had some federal officials and some uh, scientific experts to um, give small talks on the issue of water sustainability in Hawaii. We heard about the uh, rain follows um, the the uh, Rain Follows the Forest Initiative, which uh, the state uh, is enacting in uh, purchasing additional upland land in key watersheds, um, restoring reservoirs that have fallen into decay, um, and doing all this um, uh, with having water sustainability in mind. And you talk of desalination? Desalinization is an uh, extremely expensive process. There's been discussion on Kauai, there's been discussion in Honolulu of building desal plants, but it's extremely expensive and to produce the sort of volumes of water that we need uh, here in Hawaii uh, is going to cost uh, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. Um, 
But we don't see the same sort of action with regard to sea level rise. We don't see uh, workshops, we don't see laws, we don't see initiatives among the various state agencies. And um, so I'm worried that, that sea level rise is, is not really being picked up and dealt with um, as vigorously as it should. But we have to talk about it again, we have to do updates, because as we go down the pike, you're going to become more and more important. <laughs> You'll see. I'm not sure I wish it on you, <laughs> but in fact, uh, you know, your special knowledge will be more important to the community. So you have a book you've written, and yeah. we can learn about this. Uh, this is called Climate Change, What the Science Tells Us. Um, it is a, uh, it's a uh, written for the layperson, the man in the street, uh, or a freshman level college 101 text, climate change 101 text, if you like. It's published by Wiley Publishers in uh, Hoboken. Um, it's available at Amazon. You can just uh, Google climate change Fletcher, if you like. Um, it's got uh, chapters on everything we've been discussing today. And every statement in this book is footnoted to the peer-reviewed scientific literature um, that supports it. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no speculation in this book. It reports on the latest science uh, and uh, it's written for everybody to understand. These days the discussion of climate change in the media can be confusing. Um, the, the tendency for us to use doubt, a single thread of doubt, as a reason to ignore an entire body of evidence uh, is very strong in our species. And uh, the people who deny climate change for economic or political reasons have exploited this, this uh, wedge issue of doubt. And if you can simply uh, place doubt on some little uh, thread of climate change, um, which they do uh, in certain parts of the media with great effect, uh, you, know, you, you, you uh, tend to lose faith in the entire science of climate change. Well, this is a book that um, allows you to uh, learn the facts uh, and when you when you hear the fallacies of uh, the doubt the doubt sayers um, you know you'll you'll have confidence in knowing what the reality of climate change is like it's like a it's like a biblical test in a way because we know and with this kind of uh, you know a source authority uh, we can all be fully informed and now the question is whether we can do anything about it or as a group fail to do something about it. If we fail, we pay a huge price. So it tests our character as a society. It does test our character individually and as a community. And you know, as we said earlier, this is a, a golden opportunity. There's every reason to be optimistic. There's every reason to take steps to make uh, a sustainable future for, for future generations. And we've already started taking those steps. They aren't extremely difficult. They don't need to cost billions of dollars. We can all make changes in our lives, in our workplace, and as a community. Um, I think that we can beat climate change and we can, we can have a better world as a result. Thank you, Chip. That's Chip Fletcher, Associate Dean of the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. Uh, this is Think Tech Talks. We're talking about climate change with him, and I hope we'll have the opportunity to do that again soon. I'm sure we will. Thank you, Chip. Well, Thank you, Jay. Well.